It's the Get Published Radio Show. And here's your host, Gerald Everett Jones, the guy who has the answers because, well, he's made all the mistakes himself. On today's show, our topic is handmade books. We won't go back quite as far as chisel and stone tablet, but consider today a retro antidote to all things digital. You know, there may come a day when toddlers open up their parents' hand-me-down children's books and press the pages in frustration trying to find hyperlinks that just aren't there. Yeah, dig Granny's scrapbook out of the attic. You'll find some great stories there. <laughs> Hot ones, too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether it's retro response to today, today's media, but there seems to be a lot of interest in books that get made one at a time. We're going to hear from Jacob Samuel, a fine arts publisher whose limited edition books are so carefully crafted, they're considered museum pieces even when they're new. So joining us now is Jacob. Welcome to the show, Jacob. Good morning. So Jacob, what goes into the making of a handcrafted museum quality book? Well, I'll tell you. First thing is you should know about me and what I do is I'm primarily a master printer and I specialize in etching so that everything that I've published, pretty much everything, like 98%, have been books of etchings. And uh, what I do is um, I find an artist that I'm interested in, even if they haven't done any printmaking, they have um, their artwork lends itself to, to that kind of an approach. I approach them about uh, doing a project and then each project is individually tailored to whatever their you know, proclivity is. They take The projects take a long time. I mean, at least a year from conception to wow, uh, realization. Hmm. And I, I've even had some that have taken as long as seven years. Oh, wow. So, so the, uh, yeah. it, it's, a, it's a different sort of uh, event than mass market publishing. So the physical book itself is a work of art, quite apart from its literary content. Is that sort of right? Well, yeah, the, the, the book itself is a work of art. First thing, uh, rather, something I, I should say is, because I have a, such a strong um, background in printmaking, I'll tell you how the interest in books came about. I was printer for the painter Sam Francis, who was a very well-known second-generation abstract expressionist painter who lived in Santa Monica, where I live. And I worked for him for 14 years, and he started a publishing company called Lapis Press, and uh, he wanted to, he was very, uh, he lived in Europe for a while, and he was very taken by the European tradition of the Libre d'Artiste, artist book, handmade artist book, particularly by Matisse, uh, Matisse's book, Jazz. He wanted to be able to make books like that. So he was the one who really got me into it. We did two books with him, and then a book with Ed Ruscha, and a book with Richard Long, a book with William Wegman. Um, a couple of other artists, too. Joe Good, we did two books with Joe Good. A couple of other artists as well. So that's what really, um, how I got the bit by the book bug, so to speak. I really liked, because this was during the 80s, and, and during the 80s there was this big print explosion where people were making these huge, really huge prints, you know, that were like five by seven feet and, and uh, multicolor, and they were selling for, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. The thing that I liked about the artist books was it kind of went against that uh, model, and it was much more of an intimate view. And is and that market, so, uh, uh, Jacob, is that market in, in, pri primarily in Europe, or do you feel as though it caught on here? Well, I think it's caught on here, but, I, but it, it, gen it, it, it uh, genuinely began in, in Europe. It, I think it's either the European tradition, um, I mean, you know, the, the great Italian, I mean, go, I really, I'm trying to think of the earliest artist books, I'm thinking of Piranesi, which would be in the early 1800s in Italy, but these books were very large, the plates were large, they weren't, you know, intimate scale, but they were bound and, and they were made as, as souvenirs, these books of etchings that were, would be, you know, 18 inches by you know, 30 inches maybe and uh, have maybe 20 prints in it and it would be bound. And uh, Northern Europeans who came down to Italy for the Grand Tour would be able to buy these books as souvenirs because it was before photography. So the market so, is collectors, uh, is really collectors. Is that right? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, this is, this is very... Um, a very rarefied uh, market, I have to say. Uh, one, when I really began doing it, one curator at a museum um, called me a brave fool <laughs> for, under, for undertaking this. Yeah, but, how do you um, even get started in an industry it. like that? Pardon me? How do you even get started doing something like this? Well, um, I was lucky uh, because I was working for San Francis. I had an umbrella of having a day job. And so I would, um, the first books that I produced, well, actually for the first six years, were done while he was alive. He died in 94, and I published my first book in 88. And so I was able to do 
uh, to do it without a uh, worrying about a financial burden. I have a family and at the time small children, so I was I mean it was like I could throw myself into a untested enterprise. A day but job in the, the time, arts. <laughs> by the time he, he passed in ninety four, um, my business was pretty much up and running. I had six years to, to get it going and so then I could really uh, keep it going. How has the emergence of electronic media affected your marketplace, or has it at all? Well, it has affected it, and it's affected it in a good way because really? I have a website. You know, people can see the work online, and uh, I've made it a, a lot of sales for people who you know Googled an artist's name that they're interested in, and then um, you know found me and uh, contact me through email. So it's done really. It's been. Uh, very helpful. I've also haven't shied away from incorporating the digital toolbox into traditional media. I've done a number of artists where I'll um, use uh, digital prints. I work with a really great digital printer named Anthony Racco. I uh, rely on him to uh, do really fine digital printing, and then I can print etchings on top of the digital prints. And it's really beautiful. Uh, I've done it with an artist from Spain, an artist from Venezuela, an artist from Berlin. I mean, I'm really, I mean, I work internationally, so it's nice to be able to incorporate uh you know, digital technology. So I would imagine that the digital media actually facilitates your international contacts as well. Oh, yeah, sure. And I did one project with, with an artist in Berlin, and we've never even met. We did the whole thing with him, you know, FedExing me um, some uh, inks on Mylar, drawings that he did in ink on Mylar, and then I made those inks on Mylar into digital files and made photo plates of those. And, well, very you know, cool. We should, we should emphasize if people want to uh, Google or Bing, it would be Editions Jacob Samuel. Would that be right? Yeah, yeah. Edition. There's no S on the end of that. Oh, Edition. Yeah, edition Jacob Samuel. Edition Jacob yeah. Samuel. And you've actually had music. Uh, I think I went to, didn't I go to a museum exhibition that yeah. was basically well, was, uh, uh, dedicated to your work? Yeah. Arm and yeah. Hammer. Well, my, my work is, uh, the work that I've published is in museums all over the world. I mean, from, uh, you, know, every, you know, every con- country in Europe and the National Gallery of Australia. I mean, you know, Tate Gallery in England and in New York, Museum of Modern Art and Met, the Met, you know, Metropolitan Museum of New York, the Whitney Museum, San Francisco Museums and uh, Art Institute of Chicago. And so, I mean, the, th- the thing is about what I do, actually, is my main audience is museum curators. The, the projects that I do are for people who um, like to look at work under a magnifying glass. Well, that's very cool, Jacob. And I'm going to have to, we're going to have to cut it off there. But again, mm-hmm. addition, Jacob Samuel, thrilled to have you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for, uh, for calling. Get Published Radio will be right back after this message. You know, Get Published is all about helping you. Yeah, I mean you get published. And these days, the way to go is self-publishing, where there are no agents or editors or big publishing houses telling you you can't or making you feel like you're not good enough. You know, going back in history, many famous authors were self-publishers. With his own printing press, Benjamin Franklin published Poor Richard's Almanac in 1732, long before he was a famous statesman. That's how we know Ben's saying, such as, Fish and visitors smell in three days. Seriously, if you want to change your life or change the world or both, it's a great time to get in the game. Ebooks are particularly easy. With a click, you can reach a worldwide audience. Did you know that there are more people in China who read English than those of us who use the language in all the rest of the world? So if you've got a story to tell, write that memoir or that novel that's been percolating in your head. And if you're an established professional, or if you have a job you dislike or no job at all, give us that business or technical or even political book that establishes you as an expert who deserves serious attention. Yes, it's easy to get published, but understand you'll need help if you want professional results. Editors and copy editors help you clean up your prose. Book designers make the product eye-catching. And publicists help you be heard above all that social media noise. We have those support resources on our website, getpublishedradio.com. And there we've also got a request for services form where you can get personal attention for whatever might be keeping you from getting it done. That's why we say getpublishedradio.com is your doorway to unlimited self-expression. 
Hey, it's all about the First Amendment. Use it or lose it. Coming back from the break here, you know, we've been talking about handmade books. We had Jacob Samuel on talking about fine arts books. And we're joined now by David Drum, a journalist, novelist, and a poet who makes and sells his own handcrafted editions. Welcome to Get Published, David. Uh, Gerald, I'm glad I can join you. Hi, David. So I guess the definition of a handmade book is obvious, but what kinds of -of one-of-a-kind books are there? For example, what is a chapbook and how is it different from a scrapbook? Well, my definition of a chapbook, uh, Cheyenne, is a small book. Uh, A scrapbook would be something maybe meant to be viewed by close friends and family. A chapbook is more like a regular book. You you, you want the public to take a look at it. Could you tell me what kinds of books do you make by hand and how exactly do you sell them? Well, uh, what kinds of books? Uh, I, I used to advertise my press as uh, one of a kind, uh, you know, but handcrafted, individually assembled uh, poetry chapbooks in color. They're a combination of words and graphics. Uh, if you know the the book uh, Jazz by Henri Matisse, the cutouts are. Uh, world famous artworks and not to be comparing myself with him but but I try to to incorporate some of that along with words uh, poetry uh, in, in in my own books uh, how do I sell them there are a few vendors printed matter for instance is a big bookstore in New York that has a a lot of them, uh, th- there aren't many vendors here in Los Angeles. Most of these books are acquired by uh, university collections or private uh, collectors. How do I sell my books? I've, I've done it by making uh, catalogs and sending them out periodically to people I think might be interested in what I do. How did you become interested in making these sort of books? It is such a niche market, it seems like. It's definitely a niche market. It's a kind of a hybrid uh, child between art and uh, literature. Uh, I became interested by working on my own poetry at the Beyond Baroque Poetry Workshop. Uh, I was experimenting around. I underlined a few words in, in magic marker in color, and I, and I, I felt that really changed the, the words. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it shaded the words in a way that, that was interesting to me. So I went from there to maybe use, you know, cutting out some paper shapes and putting them with the uh, poetry and from there to stapling a few uh, sheets of paper together and actually making a little book. And uh, I had no idea that there was such a thing as artist books. That's the official category is artist books. Artist uh, books. But I made a few and I, you know, I did a little private printing of a book with a, uh, and went, took it around the bookstores and tried to sell it. Uh, I think George Sand took one on consignment, and but I stumbled upon a uh, like a little uh, art book gallery called uh, Artworks on La Brea, and they they took several of my books and sold them, and uh, then I thought I was off and running until the bookstore closed. We should clarify that's La Brea in Los Angeles for our listeners. Uh, at oh, far field. That's right. I'm, yeah, I'm no, sorry. we're we're I'm all sorry. over the world. Yes. Uh, but you told us recently that you attended an exhibition in Los Angeles. Can you describe the different kind of work that you saw there? Pretty difficult because any kind of uh, combination of words and graphics and uh, pictures uh, that you can imagine uh, was was there at the at the at the David Geffen Museum. Uh, I think they must have had several hundred vendors, uh, artist book vendors from around the world, uh, ranging from you know the real high end uh, art books like the German you know uh, uh, art books to a lot of handmade type books that people put together with here and there. It was. It was you know, my my head was reeling when I walked out of that art fair. There was so much to see. I just uh, took me a while to get over it. Well, you mentioned something that I thought I hadn't really heard of before. I don't think of was it postcards. You may be thinking of mail art. Oh, that's it. That's uh, it. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> see, well, I don't know. Uh, I, well, uh, mail art is uh, by you know, as you might imagine, it's something. It's art that's sent through the mail. Uh, there are these mail art shows around the world, many in Europe, and uh, uh, they're basically open art shows. They have a theme, for instance, war or a stranger or something, and uh, artists who want to uh, mail in a work of art. To, to the show. Oh, so the recipient uh, of the mail is the show. Is that right? 
No, actually, the show is the is the received work of the mail art. Uh, some sometimes people have you know put up all of the work in a gallery. Sometimes they. Uh, they 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 make a special website and they show all of the work on the website. Uh, uh, so some some of the nicer shows make make up a, a you know a nice slick paper catalog with with all with pictures of all the art in the in, in the show and they send it to the artists. Well, that's uh, really interesting that you've got a a very manual, if you will, and handmade you know a mail piece, and yet here we are in this digital world where the website might somehow accumulate it. That's true, uh, you know, and e- even extend its life a little bit. But, you know, is it about the process or is it about the end work? I mean, I, I love the process of throwing something together and, and sending it out into the world. I mean, what the world does with it, I don't know. I don't <laughs> think you can control it beyond a certain point. Well, tell us, if you will, David, what other kinds of things are you working on and, and uh, how can people find out more about you? You mentioned mail art. I've been doing quite a lot of mail art uh, recently. I I really like it. I mean, it's it's uh, my books are still for sale on the on the website uh, for Burning Books Press, which is www.burningbooks.weebly w e e b l y dot com, and you can also get there through through my w- main website at uh, burningbooks.com. People can communicate to me through the through the website if they feel and, and urge to, to do that and uh, you've got you've got you've got at, novels there as well as uh, as handmade right uh not handmade novels no 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 no, no but I, you, I, you have I, other literary works there yes uh, it, it gets a little confusing but uh, the the artist book press burning books press that that i began to sell my handmade books i'm also a non-fiction writer and when some of my books uh, went out of print, I kept the same name, Burning Books Press, and I issued reprints of those books. So it's kind of a double, you know, jointed, uh, double jointed venture now. And you, you with, are with, a uh, handmade, with, uh, you are a handmade entrepreneur. We acknowledge you, David Drum, and indeed, you are you are brave out there, <laughs> prospecting that marketplace. Well, thank you. well, thank you again for joining us this morning. Take it easy, David. Thanks, David. Hey, you too, Jerry. Thanks, Cheyenne. Bye-bye. Get Published Radio will be right back after this message. You know, in all the history of the world, with today's technology, it's never been easier to get published, to self-publish your printed book, e-book, audio book, even multimedia e-book. And not just novels and memoirs or how-to books and histories, although if that's what you've got, let's have it. But also poetry, spoken word, graphic novel, cartoons, children's picture book, interactive video, games, virtual reality, and imaginative mashups of all this stuff. Get into the game. Along the way, you'll no doubt need some professional help from an editor, a book designer, a publicist. But isn't the investment in yourself worth it? How about you take the money you'd spend on your next vacation and get famous instead? GetPublishedRadio.com. That's our support website where we've got links to all the resources you'll need. And don't forget that request for services form if you crave some personal attention. That's GetPublishedRadio.com. Hey, it's all about the First Amendment. You can use it or lose it. You know, Runkey Productions, the audio magicians can take your radio shows, podcasts, audiobooks, and ads from the streets of New York to the outer reaches of the galaxy. I think we need more echo at the end of that. Now look, visit us at runkeeproductions.com. I still think we need more cowbell. Welcome back to Get Published, where it's, well, all about getting published. Handmade books. Now that is self-publishing the hard way. (laughs) Maybe it's like steampunk, you know, what's old is new again. (laughs) Well, it's so funny to me that we did this episode this week, because actually just the other day I was going through some drawers and I found a handmade book that I had actually done in seventh or eighth grade 
full of angsty teen poems and <laughs> little artwork angsty, that I did. I love that. And angsty teen poems. <laughs> oh, I bet it's a mess. Oh, it was, yes, it was amazing. <laughs> when I was much younger, the, the handmade stuff that we did was comic books. We just loved comic books and oh. we would draw, invent our own comic books. Come up with your own superheroes. Our own and superheroes, our own characters. There was even a sort of a plot in there. At times, and we put a whole bunch of pages just cover the place with cover the place with pages. I remember hearing in I think it was the Los Angeles Unified School District where it was a reading. It was even a re, they didn't call it remedial reading, but you know these were sixteen, seventeen, eighteen-year-old kids who really didn't read very well, and they took some of these graphic novels that had suggestive drawings. I mean, they were like, you know, some busty female heroes that rode motorcycles, and I don't know, they, they had, I don't know, they had superhero capabilities or whatever. But the thing was that the, especially the boys, engaged with these stories. And then they would, they didn't necessarily read the captions, but their writing assignments would be to, you know, riff off these pictures. Mm. But Tom, you you have like graphic novel, you know, publishing in the family, right? Not quite, no. Well, my son-in-law. There you go. He's very much into it, very much interested in the business of it. Well, he, he founded this magazine in Paris, which ran for several years. And what was the name of that? Oh, gosh, cinema, just something of cinema. Okay, okay, he, cinema. He, his family had been very involved in Hollywood. His father had been a director, and he'd actually made his living by doing dubbing. He knew everybody, and John had all this access to all of these people, especially uh, television stuff, and he turned the magazine into a sort of a promotional piece for whatever was coming down the pike. And he, he just loved it. And so it was a fan magazine in a way. It was a fan magazine, but it was basically a promotion, promotional stuff. He was very good at it. And when I would go to visit, the first place he took me was to all the graphic novel stores. So he didn't actually do graphic novels himself, but he, uh, he knew everybody who did. So it, it was quite, it's quite interesting. But it wasn't so much the handmade, it might have been limited edition. No, nothing like that. It would, a lot of it was limited editions. He was very plugged into the business. He said that the primary income from graphic novels is sales to movie companies. And that indeed, the books that's, themselves, the only, that's probably the only thing that pays the bills these days. It's a pity, but you know, movie. you go to Barnes & Noble, you go to any of these bookstores, they have whole sections of these graphic novels, and I love them. I don't, I don't buy them as much as I used to, but they're beautifully, beautifully rendered. A lot of them are graphic novels based on famous stories and famous books. I bought Pride and Prejudice as a, as a graphic. It's great. So, well, Cheyenne, I know that, like, the exercise of having a child draw a picture of their family, for example, classic psychoanalytic yes. technique <laughs> of, Definitely. you know, is the house got uh, cracks in the windows? Is, you Does know, mommy have is, a weird face? Is or daddy yeah. not in the picture? Yeah. Uh, I, the I cracks think... in mommy. <laughs> 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 Going back to um, the project you were talking about that LAUSD did right, with right, getting kids' right. uh, reading comprehension up by using things like graphic novels, I think it's a really important testament to teaching kids not to learn a certain way, but teaching them in the way that they learn. And I think that's one of the biggest problems where we're having this uh, disconnect with reading levels with Amen kids is because we're forcing them to read these books that just don't capture their interest. For a lot of kids, it works, you know, it's, and I do agree that everyone, sh- there's certain works that everyone should read just the because of the, canon, of the, you know, cultural references and just there's things you need to understand that come from those books. But letting kids read what really you know, speaks to them is so important. And it's something that we're just now, I feel like, well, starting to emphasize. Well, back to, to not only what David was doing with his handmade poetry, but also with our mantra about self-publishing, maybe one way to encourage a child 
is to have them make something that looks like a book. I mean, you're going to start with your drawing. You maybe you start with your poem. You maybe start with your simply your hand lettered whatever it is. But then binding that into a pamphlet or something that has a cover, and then that as a what? Mm-hmm. As a Father's Day gift? Mm-hmm. As a as something to to, to make. A few copies and pass out to the class. Yeah, getting kids to create something is going to help them understand those classic kind of readings better, I think. That's a good way to do it. And you've got those expressive kids and it becomes performance art. (laughs) (laughs) So we've hit all, all the high spots today. Thank you, guys. And that's our show. You know, Get Published is all about self-publishing and self-expression. And that getting published and the ease of getting published these days is really all about exercising the First Amendment in this free society of ours. You know, what we need these days are more ideas. Even though we're deluged with information, we need more good ideas. And we need debate about those ideas book-length debate, not just snippets that are posted on social media, not just selfies and cute pictures of your pets, the things that you really think. And remember, because in self-publishing there are no gatekeepers out there, that is the good news and that is the bad news. So hire some good help. Perhaps you found that here. You may find it on the website, whatever you're looking for, whether it's an editor or a book designer or somebody to help you promote. But hire good help, get good advice, and by all means, Please get published. The Get Published Radio Show with Gerald Everett Jones is produced by Runky Productions. Our producer is Lori Marple and your announcer is Bill Navarro. Music by Jason Shaw. You'll find links to support services on our website, getpublishedradio.com. So whether you're an author, a publisher, or a self-promoter, get help at getpublishedradio.com. And thanks for listening.